it's uh, my pleasure today to uh, be hosting uh, this, this webinar. Unfortunately, my co-host Hendrik uh, Dressler cannot make it today because he's lost his voice. So he sends his regrets um, and he'll be joining us uh, for, for future um, uh, installations of this series. Um, but I'd like to, to um, introduce our speakers today, um, three of which I, I know I'm thankful to know fairly well. Um, so Sarah Jung is an assistant professor of surgery at UW-Madison, um, and she and I actually started graduate school together way, way back when, um, and it's been a pleasure to get to overlap with her here and there. Um, and Abby Wildridge is an assistant professor in the Industrial and Enterprise Systems Engineering School uh, at uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and I forgot to, yeah, I, I think I mentioned Sarah's at UW. And a lot of you also know Andrew Ruiz, who's the associate director for um, research at the Epistemic Analytics Lab uh, here at UW-Madison as well. Um, and they're going to be talking today about the bellwether problem publishing QE in, in new fields. Um, and I think they've also discussed a little bit uh, with me beforehand that if you have questions that you'd like to ask during, we're going to save time for questions at the end, but this can be a little bit more of a discussion if folks want to uh, uh, post um, questions into the chat, I'll be monitoring that during so uh, it can it can be kind of a more engaged uh, webinar that way. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll turn things over to uh, our uh, today's presenters. All right, thanks, Brendan, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so when uh, ISQE approached um, uh, a few of us in the uh, nascent QE uh, health and healthcare special interest group about doing a webinar, um, we sort of uh, went back and forth a little bit about what we might uh, want to present. Um, and one of the things that we thought might be really useful is to actually talk about um, publishing the first uh, QE um, uh, studies in a new field, because this is something that a lot of us in the, in the healthcare field uh, really, um, you know, really struggled with early on, was trying to figure out how to get QE um, and QE adjacent uh, research um, into, in, into print and, and really get um, people who didn't otherwise have any knowledge or interest in QE sort of interested um, in the field. And we think of this as a, as a bellwether problem because it's not just about getting that first paper published or being able to publish something on, on QE in a new field. It's actually about leading the field in a, in a different direction or new direction um, and really thinking about uh, you know, what it means to kind of bring a new approach or new way of thinking about research um, to a new set of problems or a, or a, or a field that hasn't really thought about things um, in quite that way before. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about our own experiences, uh, you know, with this challenge. Um, all of us are still obviously kind of in the middle of it. Um, and, and so this is, this is a particular perspective um, that we have. Um, your mileage may vary, obviously, different fields uh, have different conventions and, and, and different, um, uh, you know, challenges. And, and so this is, again, based on our experience from healthcare, which may or may not translate to, to all other fields, but we're, we're going to try to talk about it in a way, um, in terms of the kinds of decisions that we made or the way that we thought about, uh, you know, these challenges, and, and hopefully that will be useful for, for all of you uh, who are trying to do the same thing um, in other fields. Um, we also want this to be a little less formal than some of the uh, webinars where it's kind of a presentation and then, and then a, a Q&A period. Feel free to uh, throw questions in the chat or, or do a raise hand you know, while we're talking um, if there's things that you want to you know, unpack a little bit more as we go. We really want this to be a discussion uh, with the community um, because we, you know, we, we see this question come up a lot like in both previous ICQEs and at other events. Um, it's been a really common question. It's one of the reasons we chose this topic. And so I know a lot of you guys have questions about this and, and um, you know, we'd love to, to hear those questions. And also um, there are people in the audience who have faced the same challenge and might have other perspectives than ours that they can add to this conversation. So I'm really hoping that this will, you know, kind of provide that, that sort of deeper engagement with these, with these challenges as, as QE is growing as a, as a field of its, in, a, in and of itself. Um, and as people are starting to take it back to, to other fields as well. Um, so we sort of divided um, our, our thinking into three uh, categories. So one is thinking about venues, sort of where to publish um, and what audiences to target. Um, strategy around getting sort of from, uh, you know, sort of research that you're interested in to, uh, to a, a submission. 
Um, and then the trajectory, right? Thinking again, not just about that one paper, but about where, where is, what is that setting up? Where is everything going? Um, so we'll start, we'll start with venue. Um, and again, here we're thinking about sort of the structural constraints of, of where you publish and the audience that you're targeting. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, my colleagues, Sarah and Abby, to uh, think back a little bit on, you know, the, the first uh, paper that they were uh, trying to publish or, or even subsequent papers um, and thinking through, um, you know, sort of how to choose the, the venue for it and, 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 and what the considerations were, what the decision calculus um, was. And I'm going to put up some talking points. Um, we won't necessarily go through an order, but they're just sort of there so you have a sense of, of some of the key things that we're gonna that we're gonna touch on. So Sarah or Abby, either one of you guys wanna kick it off? Sure. I'm happy to um, to go ahead and start. So um, as Brendan mentioned, um, I work in the Department of Surgery here at UW and I do surgical education research primarily. Um, and when we were first thinking about using uh, QE and specifically um, epistemic network analysis in our work, um, we had to think about it strategically, right? Because it, it, it was new, but we also thought it would be a great way to explain a very complex environment that we were working in. Um, so I was doing some work with my uh, colleague and husband, um, He Su Jung, who's a, a trauma and acute care surgeon. And we were looking at um, simulation for teaching um, surgical trainees and nurse trainees how to um, best communicate around caring for traumatically injured patients. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty com complex situation. Um, and, and we were having difficulty um, trying to describe that complexity. Um, and, and so, you know, cho chose ENA as, as a way to, to do that. And so then we had to think, you know, strategically, how do we, how do we introduce this into the surgical education field? Um, because it, you know, it really hadn't been done um, too much at that time. Um, so the approach that, that we took was to target a um, specific conference that we knew would be open to, um, new methods. Um, so we um, used ENA to analyze the conversations in some of the trauma simulations that we were running um, and then presented that at um, an uh, American College of Surgeons um, simulation conference. Um, and, and probably, you know, some of the, the difficulties with that will come up later. But the reason that this was a nice entry for us into the, the field was that um, along with this, with presentation at this conference, which we were able to get a, a plenary presentation, um, it also came along with a um, journal submission um, to a journal called Surgery, which is, is um, well-known um, and, and fairly high impact in the, the field of surgery in general, um, not only surgical education. And so what this allowed us to do was to publish um, a study using ENA in a format that was going to reach a broad audience in the field of surgery um, that we have now been able to go back to and, and cite as we, we continue um, with our studies using ENA. So, so that was our initial approach to, to sort of breaking into the, the field. So I'll pop on and say, uh, a little bit about my story. My, the first paper that I was trying to get published is actually coming out of some work I did in, in one of David's classes. And so I didn't take the approach of sending it to a conference first. Um, instead, I was looking for a journal in uh, my, my area, like other than healthcare is human factors and systems engineering. Uh, so I was looking for a journal focused on that area, healthcare in, in that field that was open to um, not only quantitative work or not only qualitative work, but skewed a little bit more quantitative, but was okay with mixed methods research um, as a whole. So I was looking for a journal that would be happy to have a methods-based paper, maybe not in the most innovative results um, from a theoretical perspective in the field, but using ENA 
to clearly demonstrate something that we, we knew was happening and we even had an idea why it was happening. It was just hard to pick up using other analytic methods. Um, so that's, that's how we chose the journal. Um, I will say, I think we did have a little bit of an advantage because that journal at that point was publishing more quantitative um, operations research uh, simulation type data from industrial engineering. So it was a nice connection to the quantitative folks in the audience. Um, and since then, I think that journal has started pu publishing more mixed methods and qualitative work too. So it shifted a little bit as well. Thanks, Sarah and Abby. Um, I'll just add a few, uh, you know, other things, especially for for the junior scholars and the, the audience. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize is you can talk to the editors of journals. Right? You can you can email them and you can say, hey, this is a paper I'm considering. You know, do you think this is a good fit for the for for your journal um, and that kind of thing? And, and that can often be very useful because it it. It saves you time if it's not a good fit. You're not going to go and, and format it for that journal and submit it, and then wait for weeks or months to find out that they're not going to be interested in it anyway. Um, but also, those conversations with editors can actually be really useful in terms of thinking about how to how to pitch, uh, you know, the work that you're doing to that audience, and, and might actually help you, um, you know, get through the peer review process, um, uh, you know, a little more um, uh, uh, efficiently. The other thing is to think about, you know, the relative balance of publishing speed versus impact factor. And, and I think we'll get to this a little bit more later in the, in the discussion, but, um, you know, it's often, especially for the very first paper, better to get it out quickly than it is to get it in the, the highest sort of impact um, venues. I mean, obviously everybody has different constraints and, and different needs for their, their publications, but, you know, a lot of the journals that have really high impact factors also have really slow publishing processes. And again, that depends on field, but, um, but you, may, you may not want to wait that long to try and get through that, especially if it then gets rejected and then you have to try and find, a, you know, another venue for it. So often it's better to get something out in print relatively quickly that you can cite, that you can build on for your, for your subsequent um, so for your subsequent paper. So that's, that's another thing, um, another thing to think of. Um, we've already started to, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I, I just wanted to add on um, to, to what you had just said, Andrew, and, you know, um, follow up on a, a couple of these other points. So yeah, talking to the editors is, is so important. And, um, you know, I think the, the venue we picked helped, but, you know, there were definitely um, some things we learned that informed our, our strategy, which I know we're talking about next. So as we were getting um, our work published, the editor definitely had some questions um, and, and even wanted us to make some edits um, that would have um, actually not, uh, the, the statements that he wanted us to make were not true in terms of um, what the analysis that that we had actually done and, and what we were rep representing. And so it definitely was um, a conversation with the editor about um, what it was that that we did and, and how best to represent it in the, the article. And then I remember that our discussant at this particular um, conference um, who was, was very open um, to understanding what it was that we did, but he started out his discussion of our paper saying, I'm just a, a, a country trauma surgeon. And so I don't entirely know what it was that you did here, right? And I remember thinking, oh boy, okay. Um, you know, and, and he had some great questions. And, and again, we ended up having um, a really productive conversation um, with him and the, the audience in terms of questions. But, you know, I think that really informed um, our understanding of how we were going to need to situate um, QE and, and ENA within um, the surgical education context, um, because you know folks were certainly interested in um, the the approach. But um, one thing that surgical educators tend to be very interested in is application, right? What can I learn from this um, that is going to help me? be a, a better teacher to my residents and students. And so I just you know, wanted to, to throw that out there that, that having these conversations is, is really, really important. And I think actually this is a really good point. Um, it kind of comes back to something that I tell a lot of students and I think about a lot when I'm writing, which is know your audience. So talking to the editor or going to a conference that is the audience in the journal you wanna publish in, um, that's a way to get to know your audience and understand their background, what you can kind of expect them to know and what you need to build into the article 
so that they will be able to keep up with you when you get to the main points. So you won't have somebody saying, I'm just a fill in the blank and I have no idea what you did. Um, another way that isn't on the bullets here to do that is look, I'm assuming, right? You're probably gonna be publishing in journals that you read. And if you're not, or if it's maybe a smaller journal because you're going for that speed over hot, super high impact, spend a little bit of time looking through the tables of contents, looking at a few past articles, seeing if there are things that, you know, maybe skew towards mixed methods work or um, whatever the case may be, because that gives you a good idea if say you're a student and you don't feel like you can email the editor first you can, but that's a way to kind of get some of that information without actually emailing the editor. Maybe you emailed the editor and it's a pandemic and they haven't gotten back to you because life, right? Uh, so that's a, that can be a fill in the gap. Great, thanks. Um, so I think we can probably move the strategy at this point. We've already started touching on, on some of these things, but this is sort of, you know, you've got a, a result that you think is publishable and, and sort of how do you get from there to actually submitting to a, uh, uh, to a journal. So I know, Abby, you really, um, uh, thought a lot about this sort yeah. of how do you how do you build from like this very you know like a localized talk to your own department or on campus through sort of all the way to the the um journal article so maybe you can say a little bit about that yeah so i can definitely talk some about it so that paper that i wrote um started off as a course paper so i got feedback of course from the instructor and also the way the class was structured my peers um, and then i gave a departmental talk to people who read the journal that I was thinking about publishing in to talk to them about it. So we skipped the conference paper um, and said, gave the departmental talk, got some feedback, and then went straight to journal paper. So again, I think it, for me, really comes back to figure out the audience that you're trying to talk to or write to, um, and then understand where they are, the pieces they already have of the puzzle and the pieces they don't. And when I talked with the people in my field and I gave the, the campus talk, I understood pretty quickly the part that they were gonna struggle with was the method behind ENA, but there was a similar method that they understood, you know, the quantitative aspect of how do we actually develop these networks that I could use as an analogy to bridge that gap really effectively. So having given that talk and interacted with the, the attendees, let me find that analogy, which really made the whole review process a lot easier. Uh, yeah, I would I would just a um, couple things. One highlight, uh, you know, the the importance of of finding that something that um, your audience can connect to um, when you're trying to explain this, especially the first time. So um, I had kind of an an opposite. Um, experience to Abby, I think, like there wasn't, so I, I, I had tried talking about it, you know, in relationship to principal components analyses and things like that, but, um, you know, found that that really wasn't resonating um, with the audience I was working with. And so another tip I would have is make sure to have conversations like this with, with people who are doing this work and ask them about, you know, how they, um, different ways that they have presented that have seemed to resonate with folks. So I remember, you know, having a conversation with Andrew about, you know, how it was, it was difficult to, um, to find something that, that resonated with folks in terms of understanding the, the method. And he had some really great ideas and examples and tips that allowed um, me to put together a presentation that I do think, you know, really did resonate with folks and, and made, um, what what we were doing more clear so again just highlighting the the point down here you know 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 your audience right and sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error right you may present it one way and find that it's not really resonating and so then have to go back and and sort of rethink um your strategy for that um and then also you know the this idea of linking um these novel methods and techniques to domain theory um and so for me it was sort of a, a combination with theory, but also the the practicality of some of the challenges that we have in surgical education, which one is often, you know, how do we explain um, the complexity of learning that's going on in, in some of these environments, right? And so being able to talk to folks 
about this as a method to help us understand complexity that we often have a, a really different, difficult time doing um, and a way to use that to understand how to better intervene with our learners um, also was something that, that really resonated. Yeah. I, I just wanted to jump in because there's some, there's quite a bit yeah. of uh, a chatting going on right now that uh, looks pretty good. Um, and I, I hate to, to interrupt, but uh, uh -huh. Meredith mentioned that that uh, the ideas of reaching out to the um, the editors and also citing from that journal is a good idea to link it to it. And um, Rogers was following up saying that that's a great tip um, and asked in case the journal has already published using ENA, do you think it's still important to get in touch with the editors? I'll just throw in my two cents of that. I think it doesn't hurt because they might appreciate different aspects of it. Um, but Looks like I froze. <laughs> Am I back? I was say, oh, is it my shit? Yeah, you're back. Thank you, back. Okay. To, to, does the panel want to engage with um, Roger's question? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think it sort of depends, right? I mean, if you feel really comfortable with that journal and and um, you know you you know that audience really well, you wouldn't necessarily need to reach out to the editor, but it's probably not going to hurt, right? I mean, the worst thing is that they'll just not get back to you, as Abby pointed out, right? Sometimes you just don't get a, a response, or you don't get a response prom promptly enough to um, that you want to wait around. Um, but I, you know, it's it's rarely going to going to be unhelpful to talk to a to talk to an editor. So it, I think it really. Um, it's really not, you know, not going to be a problem to do it. Um, but you know, certainly there are cases where you feel comfortable enough that you don't need to, and you could just go straight to the to the submission stage. Yeah, I think I'd agree entirely with Andrew. If they're publishing, and I know they're publishing, and I know my paper is likely to fit there, I probably wouldn't spend the time. I'd probably just letter to the editor say, "Hey, I think this is a great fit," it, and cite those couple of papers from that journal. The, the interesting comment to me actually in the chat is from Pamela. And this is, I think, um, so Pamela is alluding to this fact that sometimes some of us talk about quantitative ethnography and link it to mixed methods because you're doing qual and quant things. And that is a little bit of a controversial thing in the quantitative ethnography, excuse me, QE community, um, because we, we see them as being very intertwined um, and, basically the sum of the parts is greater than the two parts individually. I would say they're still probably dis divisible personally, but I know some folks might quibble um, with that. The thing I will note, and I'm the one that's been saying mixed methods, I do that because where I publish talks about mixed methods. So that's an analogy that I'm using to get it more accepted. And of course that's pervasive, right? I get used to doing it in my I don't know if you would call it like theoretical home or I don't even know what to call it, my main field. Um, of course, it's gonna carry over when I talk to other people. So I think that's actually going back to that last point on the slide, know your audience. And sometimes being very pragmatic, um, if you're in an academic position and your focus is you need to get publications so you can demonstrate impact so that you can get tenure, so you can keep doing what you wanna do, you kind of make a few concessions along the way. And if saying this is a lot like mixed methods research helps you get published, that might not be a very bad thing to give. Now, I'm not, there are some points that of course you wouldn't give on, right? But using an analogy or language that's familiar to the field to help expose them to this new idea, to think about how we can do that more deeply, um, I think is not never a bad thing. I'm interested to hear if my panelists are gonna disagree with me now. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I definitely agree. I mean, on some level, so so I, I can tell a story from one of the first papers that I published, and it, and it was, you know, looking at uh, using um, a QE approach to do performance analysis, and it was a really complex analysis in many ways, because not only was I using ENA, which was a new, you know, a new tool for this audience, but I was doing a multimodal analysis. I was just doing a lot of stuff that, like, I knew was going to be really hard to explain to an audience that was unfamiliar. And, and as I was struggling on this paper, one, one morning I got an email from a, a collaborator, Carla Pugh, who was like, have you seen this article in, in the latest Annals of Surgery? 
Um, and I hadn't, and I looked at it and it's basically, a, it was a theoretical piece. And as it was surgery is like one of the biggest journals in the field. And it's this theoretical piece about how, you know, we spent all this time talking about like these individual behaviors or skills. And what we really care about is how surgeons integrate them. Well, we don't know how to measure that. And it was like the perfect setup. It, like I could not have paid somebody to write a better setup for the paper I was trying to write. And here it was, it's in a top journal. It was, you know, like, so, so I, could, I could basically take that and say, okay, you know, everybody's reading this piece now about, you know, how we can't just look at these skills in isolation and, and you know, how it's all about behavioral integration for better aims and everyone's saying like, well, but wait, how do we actually do that? And then I could basically just serve everything up on a platter. And it, and it helped bring the whole paper together because I didn't have to pull theory from outside the field in addition to trying to pull in new methods and techniques and, and have everything be about educating the audience, right? And so, so that I think, I think there are, you know, there are real advantages to sort of meeting the audience where they are, especially in those early papers. And then once you can, once you can build a little bit of a foundation, then you can start to write the papers you really want to write or that, you know, that do more radical things potentially on the theory side or on the method side, but then you have some, some foundation to build from. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think it is, it, I think uh, it is more important than anything to really understand the audience that you're writing for because, um, because they're going to be the ones that peer review, um, you know, they're going to be the ones that ultimately read and, and, and are likely to cite the work that you're doing. And, and if you can't find a way to reach them, um, then it's not going to matter. Yeah, David, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I mean, some some people that I, some people in the group here, I've already said something like this too. But uh, I uh, I think of, of academia as a like a cocktail party, often a really bad cocktail party, but a cocktail party nonetheless. Um, and so you know, people are sort of standing around with their drinks in their hand, you know, talking about whatever it is in their little subfield that they talk about. Um, and when you want to, and when you want to join that conversation. Like you can't just walk up and say, I did this cool thing with ENA. Like, you know, there, there ha you have to figure out the way in which the conversation, what you have links to the conversation that they're already having. Sometimes like in Andrew's case, you get really lucky. Um, sometimes it's a, you know, it's a, a smaller piece that you, that you connect to, but they're already having a discussion and, and you know, we're, we or you are sort of trying to, to join that discussion and, and insert your ideas. And that's true whether you're using ENA or not. I don't know if that's a helpful metaphor, but. Um... Yeah, I mean, I would definitely second that. I mean, academia is about communities and, and you know, publishing or giving talks or anything you do really is about engaging with some particular community or a subset of, of a community. And you have to know that community, but you also have to be willing to, to interact with it in a way that's not obnoxious, right? So um, you, you can't just crash that group of people who are having a conversation. You actually have to, to come into that conversation in a way that's and that, that, that's effective and respectful and, and, and so on. And so, yeah, that's a lot of, and that's a lot of what makes writing really challenging is that you, you're trying to figure out ways to do that that don't compromise the things that you're gonna argue and that you wanna put forward, but that do make it possible for that, uh, for, for that community to see what you're doing, to understand what you're doing and to, and, and ultimately to validate it, because again, if you can't get through the peer review process, it's ultimately not going to matter. Um, so at this point, I think we'll we'll move to trajectory, um, and then we will again after that sort of open it up to a more general discussion as well. Though please uh, feel free to keep uh, you know either raise your hand or add. add Andrew, uh, it looks like there's another question in the sure. in the um, chat. Yeah, uh, Mar Mariah asked, "What prior thinking do different fields have on the mixture compound whateverness of whatever mixed methods actually refer to?" I mean, I think that's kind of connecting to what um, David was just talking about in terms of figuring out what people are saying. And if you want to shift the discourse, you have to, I like Andrew, what you said, you got to meet the audience where they are, right? You got to figure out what they're saying and then use their same language and slowly move it potentially, not just, uh, but um, I, I don't know if people want to talk a little bit more about kind of the, the different states. I mean, obviously each field is going to be individual, but I think all of our panelists today or speakers today have at least multiple fields that they've engaged with. But um, do you guys want to tackle that question? Yeah, um, no, I, I, I thought, I think that's a really great point to, to bring up and, you know, moving from um, K through 12 education and, you know, doing my degree 
here in ed psych and then going into medical and surgical education like this idea of of mixed methods has has definitely come up and you know i think one thing that um we're working on right now is that when people say mix, mixed methods it's i mean it's not always mixed methods in terms of what they're talking about right they might say because they collected quantitative and qualitative data that it, it's mixed methods when maybe you know it wouldn't necessarily be um, defined that way by everyone who considers themselves a, a mixed methods researcher. Um, but, you know, back to, to what we were saying, I think, you know, rather than saying, and this is what I try to do as a reviewer, like, well, that's not mixed method, you know, have a conversation and with them about what it is that um, they're trying to accomplish and, you know, why, you um, why they consider it mixed methods and maybe other things for um, them to to consider because I do I do think you know there is still um, not a common definition that is always used um, around around mixed methods um, at least I've found in in our field um, and and I think you know this relates to one other point I wanted to make too around you know publishing and and helping folks to understand what it is that you're doing. Um, I think for most journals, I know the ones that I submit to, you have to suggest reviewers. And so I've also been trying to be strategic, obviously, about who I um, suggest as, as reviewers, because um, another thing I've encountered is that I have had um, papers held up because the editor was having a difficult time finding someone um, with the expertise to review them. Um, so just another thing to, to keep in mind as you're trying to get your work out there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add on top of that from the other side, like the, I get a lot of review requests and some of them I have to turn down because I'm just, I can only do so many of them, but I never turn down the ones that are either ENA papers or QE papers precisely because I know how hard it is for, uh, for journals to find people to review those papers. And, and if I'm being contacted, it's probably as, the, the person who's supposed to sort of that that side of things, and so um, you know, if you get requests to to review those kind of papers, do try to do try to honor them if you can, because it's it's probably one of your peers in this community who's who's um, submitting that paper and trying to get that work out, and and you know, we're still a pretty small community, so so you know, editors don't have a, a really deep bench of people that they can that they can go to to review um, QE or QE adjacent, um, papers. And so, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. And, and, um, you know, feel free, uh, to, to suggest reviewers who, who really will like understand the work you're doing and, and are likely to look on it favorably, um, because they'll also give you better feedback, right? Even if they think that at the stage the paper is at, it's not quite ready to publish, the feedback you get from those people will be a lot better than the feedback you get from someone who's not that engaged with, uh, the QE side of things. And so, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll definitely plus one uh, the, that suggestion to, to put in suggested reviewers. This my I think that's a great um, suggestion. Definitely think about who you suggest as reviewers carefully and do it. Don't just leave it blank, you know, even if it's optional. The other thing that I'm going to say in response to this is actually related to the idea of trajectory. So, um, not all fields have a common accepted definition of what mixed methods or multiple methods, whatever it is. In my field where I have this luxury now of using the analogy and using that to kind of make it easier, we wrote the paper that defined what mixed methods was and did a systematic review. So think about order you publish and how it can help you. Uh, and Andrew, I hope I haven't stolen your thunder there. So I'm gonna mute myself. Um, yeah, so I, I think like, you know, uh, that's a really great transition to thinking about trajectory, right? So there is some some sense in which you're just trying to get that first paper published, but it's it's really important even when you're doing that to think about the sort of next papers, right? What does the longer game look like? Um, uh, and so I, a lot of this is just about the questions that you're going to ask of, your, of yourself because you know, this may be particular to the, the research that you're doing, um, it may be field specific, you know, whether you want to lead with something theoretical, something methodological, whether a systematic review would be really helpful, like there's a, there's a lot of considerations, it's hard to give kind of a, even a template for that, because I think there's a lot of different ways you could, you could 
think through an effective trajectory of publishing those first few papers, but um, but it's important to be thinking about it. I think that's really the, the, the kind of key thing that really thinking beyond that first paper you're trying to publish to what do you want to be publishing second, third, fourth, um, especially because your highest impact paper is probably not going to be the first one in that field. It might, but more likely it's going to be the second or third or fourth paper when, when you've already sort of built that understanding and then you can really you can really write the paper that that kind of does it all um so i mean i think that's um uh just some general considerations but um uh, abby or sarah if you guys want to think uh just uh, talk a little bit about um how you guys have thought about this in your own um trajectories um i think that'd be useful for, for people to hear yeah um so definitely for for me it was about um getting something out there. Uh, like I said, we um, targeted surgery um, journal first, um, kind of trying to be strategic about, you know, um, a, a journal that we we felt would um, be open to publishing the work because they do sort of do a mix of quantitative, qualitative um, type things, but also um, that was going to be well known enough um, in the surgical community for us to to cite um, in in future publications. Um, so you know that that's been nice. We've had a, a few papers um, since Andrew has. Um, the other plug I wanted to put in was also for um, keeping up on what is going on in, in this community, the QE community, um, what your your colleagues are doing. Because um, now as I'm writing um, and um, I just put in a, a grant to a foundation um, and, and proposed ENA as one of my methods. And it's great for me to be able to cite that I've done it, obviously to show that I have expertise, but also um, the, the foundation is looking at medical education and education more broadly. And so it was really important for me to be able to show that, you know, this has been used um, in other contexts as well um, in, in medicine and, and in education. And so, um, you know, that's kind of how I've, I've thought about it, I guess, like being able to show um, my reviewer that I have expertise in this, other people have expertise in it. Um, it's, it's, um, been used broadly and, um, you know, and, and accepted um, and known way to, to approach these types of analyses. Yeah, so I think this is a part of this, this academic game that is a little challenging for me because there's a lot of strategy involved and it's a lot to try and manage. So when you go to publish one paper, it is really good to think about what do I need to, to write the next paper, but also kind of when you're at this stage um, of you're thinking about, I wanna write this project, I wanna write this proposal down the line, think about what you'll need for that proposal. So that's what Sarah was just describing. So you're kind of playing this game of thinking about, okay, I wanna be here, what do I need to do to get there? And then also, okay, I'm here, what can come next so you're kind of looking both ways and in some ways that's a little bit um when i was first out of my phd in a, in a professorship that was something that i had to learn and think about doing but it's really uh, valuable in the long run so i think at this point well uh uh encourage you all to go out and get writing, but um, also uh, open it up um, for other questions or things that, um, uh, you know, that um, uh, you still have questions about in terms of, of you know, issues of, of publishing QE in a, in a new field. Um, I, we're happy to take questions about specific fields. I can't guarantee you that there's someone in the audience who, who will be able to help on that, but feel free to pose the question. Um, uh, if, we, if we can't answer it, maybe we can find someone who can offline at some point. Um, uh, or any other questions that you have about publishing, um, I think this is, this is a really good opportunity to ask those. So, uh, so the floor is open. Yeah, I think I have, uh, maybe it's not a question or comments, but uh, sorry, I have some little noise in the background. 
have so many helpers at, at this time. But uh, so my question is on the, it's not a question, but it's on, I've been working on a QE paper with a, with a colleague and, uh, and at some point we're talking about, okay, what's the best venue? Is it a, a place where we already have QE papers or a paper, a place where, because maybe those people already know the approach and they will get very critical reviews. But of course, from the discussion now, it's, I think it's better to actually go to a place where people already know this work. And I think it's, it makes it easier possibly. But in case you have a different uh, perspective, then I will come that. Then the other thing is on the class, uh, I think you, uh, you highlighted on the issue of uh, having a campus talk. Like today I had uh, a talk about ENA. So that was my first time to talk about ENA. So Brendan, thanks for the materials and Sylvie. And so it was interesting in my lab because these are people who are doing, there's so much into the learning sciences and they do a lot of qualitative work and, and transaction analysis and rather interaction analysis. And we are so curious to know, okay, what does this method, how does it work? And I tried my best of course to explain and and in the end, I was curious to know, okay, what do they think about the approach? And, and in the end, I saw like the questions they had were more of, okay, this approach maybe is better for, because I attached that tutorial paper, like which was explaining about the experts and uh, versus the novice and say, so maybe it could be better for such a kind of audience, rather kind of uh, a case. But then, so uh, they were asking, okay, how do you get relevant codes and how do you, for example, in, a, in, a, in the context of, uh, of uh, education, how do you really make sure that what you are actually visualizing is is with the, is what is actually existing? So, I mean, I tried to highlight that because I didn't have much time to go through all the coding approach and coding process that is uh, involved in the Kiwi, but I highlighted that, that that's one of the uh, main things that is emphasized in Kiwi. But to cut it short, uh, I feel that that's, that that's a very relevant approach, like having a campus talk here, what people think, and later they thought, this is interesting. And I think they said, oh, I think we, we may have uh, people from the lab, uh, uh, maybe David and, and the colleagues to come and have a, a talk and we see whether we do more stuff and collaboration with them. So I think that's a really an interesting approach, uh, I think from my perspective. Yeah, no, I'll just um, throw out that I think one of the things that I think about in terms of publishing sort of internally or externally, right, publishing for the QE community versus publishing for a, uh, you know, a, a, a different field is, is also partly on the goals of that publication. You know, if it's a, if it's really a, a about QE methods, right, and some advance in QE methods, it makes sense to target a venue that's going to be mostly, where it's mostly other QE folks who are going to pay attention to it. You know, if it's more of an empirical uh, uh, study that's kind of domain specific, or if I'm really addressing a, a problem or a challenge that a, a, another field is having, certainly those are things I could bring to the Kiwi community. But more likely, they'll 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 have more legs if I if I take them to those fields. And so I think at least uh, some of the time, that's sort of uh, that's sort of the calculus that that I'm that I use in terms of thinking of, of where to place things. Um, again, there's certainly exceptions to that, but. Um, but, but I think a lot of it is, again, back to this sort of the cocktail party analogy, like what, what group do you want to sort of move into and start talking to? Um, you know, is it other people that do QE already and they've already drunk the Kool-Aid and, and are, are bought in? Or, um, you know, is it uh, people who are working on a particular problem or a class of problems or, um, uh, you know, uh, think about problems in a particular way and you want to talk to them and you want to bring QE into that conversation? I think what Andrew said is 100% spot on in how I think about it. Every time I'm working on a paper, whether it's single author, a student's lead, or I'm leading with co-authors, I come up with like a one to two sentence. This is the main point that I wanna make with this paper. Um, and if it's about quantitative ethnography and some methods for in QE, it needs to go somewhere that's using that language and talking about it. If it's domain specific, like we should get clinicians together to do a team handoff rather than have them like play phone tag, then it's gonna to go to a journal that's talking about that. Or if it's something like, well, the way we design processes that can support teams work or make it much, much more difficult for the team to accomplish that goal, then it's probably gonna to go to a human factors or teams type of journal, right? So that main point, having a really clear vision of that main point as early as you can in the writing process 
makes your life a lot easier because it everything else follows it, in my opinion. Yeah. This is, oh. Go ahead, Brandon. No, no, I, you should add because I was going to turn to other comments and things. Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I was actually going to, um, I was looking at David's comment in the chat Perfect. about, um, you know, uh, quant methods where quant methods are considered the quote unquote gold standard. Um, a hook can be that, that QE is, it gives a quant model to connect qualitative data and research. And yes, absolutely. I think, you know, that's a, that's a hook that we, and that I've been able to use, you know, I think, um, the field of medical education is evolving and um, definitely qualitative research is being used more and more, becoming more and more accepted. Um, more journals are, are publishing it that maybe haven't in the past, but also, um, you know, I think um, for many folks, um, they do consider quant the, the gold standard. And so um, a useful way to describe it and actually a just had a, a colleague, um, Sarah Larson, present. We had our Association for Surgical Education conference last week, and she presented a paper um, and, and used um, ENA as, as one of the methods. And, you know, was, I mean, that's exactly how she described it, right? Like, we have all of this complex qualitative data, um, and here's a way for us to, to quantify it and be able to see these comparisons as well as make some statistical comparisons. And, I mean, that really, it really resonated with with the group. Um, it was it was cool to see the the questions that arose, and it wasn't questions around the method. It was questions about you know what was found with that method, and so um, it's been um, kind of fun to to see it evolve into you know not fixating necessarily so much on the method, but but rather what the method allows us to um, to be able to say. Yeah, the other interesting thing about medicine, which is probably uh, somewhat different from a lot of fields, is that they very much are sort of quant forward in that way, but they also have this tremendous respect for expertise and this idea that like, well, you know, um, you know, only an expert surgeon can really assess like, you know, how well someone's doing a surgery or things like that, where, it, where there's that sort of tension between being able to quantify something, but also sort of believing deep down that like, nothing's going to really replace that qualitative judgment, right? And so in some ways that actually set up a re that was a very good setup for, for something like QE because it's really about uh, uh, elevating both of those, right? And, 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 um, and not one or the other, right? And so, and so I think, in, at least in my work, that's actually been really useful um, to, to be able to acknowledge both sides of that and then, and then say, look, and, and if we unify them, we get something even better, right? Um, and, and I think that's, that's been a really um, uh, powerful or persuasive argument in that field. And again, every field is different, but I, I think that's a unique tension, in many ways, a unique tension in medicine that, that um, has also made QE a little bit easier potentially to, to introduce to, to that field. I want to uh, throw something out really quick. Um, Mariah asked a good question about kind of foot in the door examples. Um, Car and Frey, I think, has done some of some really great thinking here. I know that she's had really great results in hand and metered them out very slowly and watered them down to make them palatable for her audience. So this is exactly what I think our panelists was talking about today is to say, okay, I know where these people are. And also Ada, one of, one of her co-authors has done a lot of thinking about that. And that was a big parts of the discussions in terms of putting together um, these articles was to say, okay, how do they think about these things? What are they gonna want? What's gonna be a bridge too far? And then knowing that then you can actually space them out and not even get to what you think is the meatiest thing until they've already kind of accepted the methodology initially and, and not found it threatening and not had it be too complex to digest. Um, so I like those two as you can see that they're actually, ENA is a pretty small part and there's a lot of other meat in those articles. And that's one potential strategy, but again, it depends on the community and the audience, I think. Um, so I'd like to, to um, ask, we, we're, I'm going to save a little bit of a time for announcements at the end, but I think this has been a very good uh, discussion and engaged discussion. Um, what other questions do folks have, uh, things that they want to ask or comments that people would like to make? 
And while people are thinking, I'll, I'll just say too, you know, if we don't have enough time during the webinar to answer all the questions you have, or if you think of something later, feel free to reach out to us, send us an email, um, you know, uh, post a Slack. on Slack. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, of venues and so you know as you as you start to work on those papers or as you are thinking about this you know more deeply and uh, you know later if, if questions come up you know I think I won't speak for anyone else but I'm certainly ha happy to answer questions or, or you know set up time to chat with people and, and I know a lot of my colleagues are as well. I just unmuted myself because um, when I was looking for foot in the door and when I have students looking for those foot in the door in the web tool, the ENA web tool, that methods write up the references in that methods list is a nice solid starting point. And even if it's outside of your field, those papers are good resources to point people to, to say, hey, you have questions about the math, go look here. Hey, you have questions about how we go back to quality debt, go look here. So use that, I think that's what I think of as the list. <laughs> Although I'm really excited about these papers you dropped in, Brendan. Now I'm gonna go dig into them. I, I have, I, I'm, I'm noticing in the chat, there's, a, there's been some back and forth about, about mixed methods and multiple methods and so on. I, one of the things, so this is a challenge that people sometimes face is that is basically the, I would call it the sort of, but what about question that people get who when they're writing in a QE framework, but why isn't this just X? Why isn't this just Y? Um, and, uh, you know, I, what I try and do when I get in those situations is uh, to just specifically talk about what the affordances are of what I'm doing for the question that I'm interested in, rather than trying to get into a bar fight about whether something's considered mixed methods or multiple methods or, or anything else. Um, and, you know, I, I I do that in part because I actually think that a lot of the literature on or the whole sort of discussion of mixed methods is a little bit, um, well, vapid, honestly, I'm, <clears throat> in the sense that uh, even making a distinction between the multiple methods and a mixed method, meaning that the two methods are actually mixed, um, is uh, like, it doesn't actually tell you very much about what that mixture, what it means to be mixing the methods. Uh, you know, is, is it really just, I do a survey and then from the survey, I choose my qualitative participants or, uh, you know, I, I run a regression and then based on the reg a regression, I look at qualitative folks to follow up with, or I do a qualitative analysis to help just, you know, create my survey. I mean, sure, those are mixed, but there isn't really much discussion there about what, what the epistemological entailments are. Like, what does it actually mean um, to be mixing and, and what, are, what does that do to the claims and the warrants that you make? Um, so in a sense, there isn't much purchase to get on what the difference between QE and that is because there's actually not much there in the, in the comparison. So as a result, focusing just on what is it that we're, you're trying to do with QE rather than is this the same or different than something else? Seems, seems to me the kind of better bet. I saw Sarah and, and, and Abby nodding while I was saying that. And so I guess maybe I'm not too far off. Yeah, no, I, I would absolutely agree. Um, I think there's that and, you know, there's other things that come up too where, you know, exactly as David said, rather than like spending the, the time arguing, like, is this or isn't it, right? It's like, well, what, what is it about? What's the perspective? What is what is this buying you, right? And you know, is the argument that you're making for that really solid, you know, rather than what what is the specific terminology? I guess, yeah. So I would I would definitely agree. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it, for me, it all comes back to that point. And if I'm gonna, I probably never will because this would make my head hurt and I would get irritated. But if I was going to write a paper. And the point was mixed methods needs to be this, that, and the other. And it can't just be something as simple as you do a survey to pick a participant. There's not true integration. Okay, fine. Then I'd spend the word space doing it. But I don't want to write that paper one. And two, that's not the point of any of the papers I'm writing. So like, I really like David's term of a bar fight. It's a bar fight. There's no value. Why well, have the argument? Except if you're in a research methods class and your professor makes you. A safe, a safe space for a bar fight, right? Um, 
we've got uh, one more um, question we can sneak in here before uh, we, we wrap things up. Unfortunately, I, I feel bad because I think the conversation is really good. Um, but it looks like uh, Xu Qi was saying, Professor Schaefer mentioned we need to connect our research with some existing published paper. I'm wondering if we think QE is a good way to solve a problem in the world, uh, but we do not know where the result will lead us, right? Lead us to how should we navigate our paper searching and what is the strategy to build codes and data mining or sense making? Uh, th this is a, a pretty deep, uh, a pretty deep question, but um, you know, do you guys want to take a, a crack at that and kind of the remaining few minutes we have? I want to take a first stab if that's okay with you, Andrew. Yeah, go for it. So if you're publishing in a new domain or um, really anywhere, I'm going to exclude like learning, learning sciences since that's where ENA comes from. The papers you need to look at to figure out what conversation you can join are not here. You need to be looking at your domain. So like if I was writing about teams in healthcare, I'd be reading papers about teams in healthcare not including QE as a search term initially. Maybe once I've started writing the paper and I'm like, okay, let me see if there's a journal that has this. Maybe I do a really quick and dirty search, but I already know my codes. I already have done the analysis. I already know how it's doing with most of that domain's literature and knowledge. So in a sense, when you're doing this, going into a new field, you have to be really on your game because you need to know the literature of the field or the domain you're moving into plus the, the theory, philosophy, and the field of quantitative ethnography. It's kind of a, you're jamming two things into one. And I think that's a really important thing uh, to be aware of. Yeah, I think also if you wanna address sort of practical or pragmatic uh, challenges, there's, there's work you need to do. This is back to the trajectory point, right? But, you know, first you have to convince people that, you know, that, that the method is sound and then you have, you, have, and, and, you, know, that you have the right set of codes and that you have the right models and things like that. That's, there's sort of preparatory work to being able to then scale that up essentially into, into a more practical problem. And so I think a lot of that is about thinking through how, how you build that acceptance so that by the time you, you actually want to get to the scale up uh, sort of portion or you know, do something with those, uh, those uh, methods that will have some real world implications, whether it's assessment or whether it's um, you know, uh, characterization of something or whatever it is, like you have to have already, by that point you have to have already established everything that that's built on. Um, and so I think that's, that's a, a, you know, a good place to think about that trajectory is, you know, how do you, how do you understand, you know, how do you establish that this is the right uh, code book for understanding this problem? And then how, you know, how do you understand that this way of, of, of modeling things is the right way to approach that kind of problem? And so there's some smaller studies presumably that you're doing to kind of lay that groundwork before you get to the point of, of doing something that has, has implications beyond academic ones, right? That actually affect real world decision-making in some way. Great, and I, I hate to cut this short. I also noticed Meredith uh, posted in the chat, uh, you know, we can continue, as Andrew mentioned, we can continue these conversations, um, but I'd like to just give a quick round of applause and say thank you to uh, our speakers today. It's really appreciated. Um, I have a couple uh, quick announcements. Um, one is we'll be uh, posting and announcing the next webinar series um, uh, soon. We, we have uh, tentative speakers lined up, but we're just finalizing exactly um, who they're going to be. But it's a team that uh, was successful at the first uh, COVID data challenge that we had, and that will be June 14th. So look uh, on the website and also we'll be making an out Twitter and email um, for references there. And then following up that on uh, July 12th, we're going to have Yotam Hode uh, speaking about putting the keeping or putting the E in QE. So uh, focusing on the ethnographic perspective. Another quick announcement, since we're talking about publications, um, I'm announcing that the International Society for Quantitative Ethnography is pushing back the deadline for submissions uh, two weeks to be um, in, in uh, mid-June rather than at the end of May. So you have a little bit more breathing room just under six weeks from right now. So that's a heads up to everybody. You'll be seeing uh, communications around that, but there's an extension there that we wanted to share. Um, so yeah, thank you all again. Uh, we're, we're a little bit uh, over, we're at full time, although we started a couple minutes late. Um, so keep in mind that we've got that extension. Also keep these discussions going. I think this is, these are great conversations to be having. And I like that we can be explicit about kind of our strategy and share things that have worked or things to avoid. Um, when we're trying to be successful as we um, share 
these approaches and, and ways of thinking with folks. So thanks again um, to everybody and uh, getting us off to a great start for this, this season of webinars.